Hello everyone, my name is Manuel Fernandez and I am going to give a brief tour of my end of the semester project for my grad school class, uh, Edit 5390, where we had to develop a fully asynchronous online class. So I went with my course, uh, which was about productivity and it's not productivity in the sense of like logistics and, and, and corporate productivity, but like building healthy habits, uh, you know, getting, uh, basically getting your life in order to some extent. Um, so I call that productivity work smarter, not harder. The description is here, as you'll be able to see. Uh, it is about developing habits for school, work, or life that help you develop productivity systems that can be maintained or are beneficial to you as an individual to maintain a work-life balance uh, or school performance or improve your physical or mental health. Uh, so for example, this course would be perfect for people that are having trouble focusing, are constantly making to-do lists because they are filled with ideas or they know they need to get things done, but they're never finishing them. They have professional or life goals that are not progressing. So these would this would hopefully be the course for you. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as a brief, uh, before I get before I go into the course, we use Moodle. Uh, the Texas Tech has a Moodle server, so this is what it, what Moodle looks like. Uh, I was not, a, quote unquote, allowed. Like the instructors recommended that we did not change the theme for the, the, from the default system. So it is green and orange for most of the part, but I try to make it as clean and, and nice looking as possible. So with that said, let's begin. So once you get into the course, the course starting point is gonna take you directly to the announcements area, the journal prompt that they need to be thinking about from the very beginning. As soon as they walk and they enter the, the course, they need to think about what are you learning that week what did you succeed at regarding this course? And what are you challenged the most by this week? They technically are supposed to do this every week near or about the end of the, of the, of the week period. Uh, and I had to build four modules. I had to build three modules and an introduction and an introduction module. So about, so five items uh, of content, four items of content. I went with four modules. So we have, um, and, and those in three of the modules were added, you know, I added basically an extra week. So I got, um, so basically they have to do this like 10 times, right? Okay, so we have the course schedule as well. One of the requirements was that we have to have the course schedule available for the students to check the activities that are due during that week. One of the things that I was really excited to implement for this semester, because I've been talking about it do anybody that knows me, uh, both professionally uh, and as friends and colleagues, I've been talking about digital annotation. So I got to use Hypothesis and Peruso for different functions because um, each has their benefit and, and uh, each, you know, they have their pros and cons. So I got to use um, Hypothesis for this specifically. So I uploaded the PDF to Hypothesis and it allowed them to do like annotate. This is not a graded activity. I just allowed them to annotate in case they have like questions or they can, uh, one of the things I did for my own classes when I use annotate uh, hypothesis in like the Blackboard LMS, I have like a page note that, that would be kind of filled like right here. And then I would go through like each module and be like, did this, did this, did this, did this. So I thought that would be like a good way to get the students to get organized, right? But yeah, so I use hypothesis as a great way for the students to communicate with the text and, and communicate with me as an instructor. Uh, so that's that's the, the starting point area. That's what I wanted them to focus when they first get in. Next, we have the start here module where I went ahead and introduced the course. I introduced my credentials, my experience as a technology trainer and support at University of Houston. And now that I am working at University of St. Thomas as an instructional designer, uh, also the fact that I'm as a, as a dad, as a grad student, as a professional with a career, um, I have to handle a lot of things, juggle a lot of, spin a lot of plates up in air. So having a good productivity system helps, you know, it's also, it, I also picked this class or this topic because, you know, 
teaching a class is you're learning as much as your students are. So I think I learned a lot actually developing this class as a, a, as much as somebody would if they took this class. So uh, hopefully I came out uh, a better person at the at the end. So uh, so the welcome message, in, you know, Intel kind of gives them the same brief overview of what we're going to be covering, like developing productivity systems through the cultivation of habits and time management strategies and the use of technology. Technology is very key, uh, I think, in making uh, in organizing and getting things done. Uh, it can also be distractive, so we have some discussions and, argue, and, and blog prompts about that. The next, I give them the objective for that specific module, which is to understand the syllabus and the expectations, and then go and introduce themselves. So I did an introduction board. It's very common to do an introduce, introduce yourself discussion board, uh, but I did do the syllabus in hypothesis. Rami Kalir has this uh, marginal syllabus. There's also the um, really great activity of having your students annotate the syllabus. Instead of giving them like a, like a syllabus quiz, like you're hoping or not hoping, but you're, you're quizzing them to see who didn't read it and kind of give them a bad grade over it. This is like, I want you to read and I want you to ask me questions and I want you to, um, as I have in one of the, the annotation comments, I actually want to negotiate parts of the syllabus with my students because I want them to be involved from the very get-go. Uh, so I would love to hear their feedback from the very beginning, like what point value should be for quizzes or what, um, do you want to see more blogs or do you want to see more discussion boards? Like maybe they're not as comfortable with a, a public audience kind of activity and they'd rather just discuss among themselves. So. Uh, I figured that having these options there would be great. And I think it's a better alternative. Personally, I think it's a better alternative than having those quizzes. Uh, don't get me wrong, you can still have a quiz as a reinforcer, that syllabus is very important. But for myself, I thought this would be like a good alternative. I tried to, because this was my course, <laughs> my baby. <laughs> I try to do all the things that I think are really cool in the instructional design area, which I'll talk about as we go through. So it was my chance to play in a sandbox and do something I was like genuinely excited to make. My only wish is that I will be able to have somebody take this class and tell me what they think or and maybe then I realize maybe this is not all that's cracked up to be. But anyways, so the students have to read. Uh, their syllabus, and then the I because annotations are going to be a very big part of the class. I develop like a quality annotations guideline for both hypothesis and so and perusal. So that's the uh, quality of annotations. Also, because all of these annotations are social in nature, I um, I listed an etiquette guideline, which is be polite and respectful respectful to the author and to your classmates. Like it's okay to critique the author's points or the or your classmates points, but you cannot attack their person, right? Uh, especially like things like productivity, like habits and time management strategies. And that can kind of get like judgy sometimes. So the best thing is like attack the point, not the author, right? Uh, so because technology was very important or at least I saw it as a very important component, I decided to uh, select Notion for this. It's very big in the productivity sphere. It's a great tool, tool. it's like a Swiss knife, army knife. You basically have the ability to embed uh, documents like live, like say for example, I can pull like a Google Drive uh, spreadsheet and put it in and actually mess with the spreadsheet inside of a Notion page. I can create um, headings, text, then create a sub page, then create sub pages within that sub page. I can do tables that are databases, uh, Kanban boards, um, calendars. So it's it can get really, really complicated, which I think if you start getting your productivity system designed and developed, that can become very useful. And maybe at the end of this recording, I could talk about a notion a little bit, but I thought it was a really fantastic tool. I wanted to get the students to get familiarized with it. 
I also give them some alternatives. Like you don't have to use Notion. There's Obsidian, which is like a Notion alternative, which I also think it's really neat. Um, Google Drive, I used to do all my notes when I was a college student in Google Drive. So like that totally works. Uh, Trello, uh, Evernote, Evernote's very basic. And Apple Notes is starting to get much better. And Trello is like your project management thing, but they have a lot of templates for like planning trips and, you know, spring cleaning, et cetera. So I think all those tools are great as a way for the students to get familiarized with that, um, with the ability of using technology to improve their lives. So with the specific solution of Notion, I also shared a Notion's basic playlist. And then later down the line, in module four, well, technically throughout the entire semester, I was hoping that they would use Notion for a couple of things, but down at the end of the, uh, for module four, near the end of the semester, they would have to actually develop something straight up in Notion as part of a, a grade. So we have the introduce yourself assignment. Uh, so see, I do ask them to, like, I suggest that they can include images, a GIF or a meme, just to keep it light as an icebreaker activity. Next, we have the modules. So starting with module one, we had to develop from the beginning of the semester. We had Word document templates that where we had to work out the objectives, the topics that we were gonna talk about. So these are uh, then translate, these were then translated to uh, Moodle. At least I personally did that. Uh, I know other classmates who just link to those, art, to those documents, that's great. I thought that if this is going to be all in, like one of the best things to do is to keep them coming back to the to the course is to have the material in the course. Um, so, with that said, we have the objectives. I tried, and you'll see later. Um, actually, I won't say it. I'll see if you notice. Um, but I added images to eat to the top of the modules, which I didn't necessarily have to do, but I think it would be like a neat uh, Easter egg. So then we have objectives where I list out what the students are hopefully going to accomplish by the end of the module. Obviously, um, I realized thanks to my colleagues and uh, previous and faculty that I used to work with when I was talking about this on Facebook, that asking them to read like four chapters of a book, especially if this class is aimed like at a freshman seminar level, level was not gonna be successful and it was gonna create a lot of friction. So. I ended up having to split the modules into two weeks, giving them time to read the chapters, read other comp other activities, like do other activities, do discussions, do blogs, do uh, prompts, et cetera. And that gives them enough time, like they have a breather room where if they didn't finish the annotations on the first week, they can continue. So. So with that, I have week one, which is read the Atomic Habits intro on chapter one and read an uh, article on burnout, uh, hopefully trying to connect that burnout is an environmental problem and there are ways to deal with it as a personal, uh, as an individual. But I, one of the things I do wanna stress the critique is being productive to continue working in an unhealthy environment or continue working in a, in a way that is unhealthy is not the goal of this course. So we even have, um, I think here, uh, one of the prompts is, should we even be productive? Like that is the question, like if somebody in the class said no, then maybe going forward, you know, uh, I would, uh, you know, one of the things with a live class, I would have loved to put them into a group and then have like pro-productive people and anti-productive people and have like a debate as one of the activities that come up organically, right? It wouldn't have been in the syllabus. I just would have loved to see that um, in, in a live course. But uh, so we broke it, I broke it into two weeks. Uh, and I did that for the, for the rest of the, um, for three other modules. So I also, uh, one of the things you, you know, I realized and I, uh, this is, this video is kind of like a reflection, a video journal of what I did. I honestly should have uh, clocked in a couple more video journals, uh, but I've talked to colleagues about this. So um, I guess this is it. Uh, but one of the things you realize when you're getting to the rubber hits the road and like, okay, well, I need 
uh, the students need to identify productivity, but your book is primarily about habits and cultivating good habits. Maybe you need a PowerPoint slide on what productivity means, quote unquote, to the class. It's fun to think about that, the way that language can be used for a variety of definitions, like how in science, hypothesis or, or uh, a law has a completely different meaning from a law class where you have a law or the hypothesis of a case, you know? Uh, same thing here. Our definition of productivity is much different from what you would have in an economics class uh, to some extent. So I honestly, I did make reference to that, but I, need, I realized that, well, if part of my goal outcome is to have the students identify the define, define productivity, uh, then I think I need to have that in the slides or something. Um, but uh, one of the things, Again, one of the things that I was super happy that I got to use is the digital annotations. I think one of the benefits of Moodle, I will say, is it was super flexible. Like it let me do, um, also I wanna thank Caruso and Hypothesis. I don't know where I, if I, I don't, I'm not gonna edit this. So this is me rambling, but I would love to thank Caruso and Hypothesis for actually sending me like secret keys to use for an LTI after I explained, hey, I'm a graduate student, I would like to use this for a course. And they're like, sure, no problem. <laughs> so that was great. And Moodle was super flexible. Like I did not have to uh, go up the chain of command and try and get like the Moodle system admin to give me like LTI management permissions. I was just able to do that in my own course. So yes, it was great. Um, I was so excited that this was done. Um, so each of these reading annotation class, um, activities would have had guided questions. So you can see some of these are marked with guided, like a um, little orange question mark. I uh, also would have introduced like features of what the perusal can do, like adding emojis, you know, so to let the students know like not every, not every annotation has to be like high stakes where they write like a essay length paragraph or like a paragraph um, um, or five for a, a single highlight, right? So yeah, I would have, you know, uh, also introducing them to like different activities, like hashtags would create the ability to categorize everything inside of like their own subsections. So technically I could do like quote worthy, or when we talk about backwards design, I could create a hashtag on that. So students can then, when they find those themes or points throughout the book, they can do hashtag and add, continue to add those, those annotations into there. Uh, so I was really excited. So technically, if this is a live class, we would see upwards of 30 to hundreds of comments, which I think can supplant like, one, if, if you're looking at the modules, and you're like, well, that's a little light in terms of activities. If you look at the reading and you look at the fact that the students are gonna be doing a lot of writing and I'm expecting like quality annotations, which can include like elaborating on the author's point, fact-checking the authors or other uh, classmate statements, connecting the text to their, their own lived experience. They're doing a lot of work in the reading. So that's partly why some of it, 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 sometimes it feels light. Like I look at it as I was finishing and submitting for my class. I'm like, oh my God, I hope this covers everything. But I think this, this like annotations are a really strong, strong component in any class. It can be in any class. So that's why I went with it. And I was super happy that I was, that uh, Moodle was flexible enough to let me do both, right? So I also had an article on, uh, science of burnout, which uh, used per, uh, hypothesis for that one. And um, if you if you ever see this, you run across in the wild and this video because I'm gonna put it up on YouTube. If you see this and you want to know more about in either perusal or hypothesis, message me. I'll put my contact information and in the details or uh, somewhere down at the bottom. 
and you can message me and I'll do it. I can do a tour, like a how to, but yeah. So we have an article on exhaustion, like burnout, especially with everything that's been going on the last two years, the pandemic and working from home. So you might want to keep in mind that there's a problem in an environment and also the way that people can cope with that environment can be through like healthy habits, right? So I hope that students would have gained something from that. So then we have a discussion for like having them define what productivity means. So also kind of gauging. So you've read the book, you read a little bit about the annotation, uh, about the burnout. I want you to define it in your own words. Like, what is productivity? Like, does it mean like sleeping five hours and getting up at the crack of dawn? Are you kind of like a hustle, like hustle or, or grind, like get that bread grind mindset? Uh, I don't, personally, I'm not a fan of that. So my hope would be to see some of that discussion happen in there and then move to a more healthier approach to getting things done, right? Then we have the slides that I did. I only did nine slides. It really, if this, uh, technically these slides would have been a video. Um, it really is very basic uh, lesson here. And then talking about how productivity is a big field. And it's very also, um, it's also advertised or used to justify like software purchasing and a lot of other things. So it's reframing productivity from like, you know, inputs and outputs into like the, the, the confluence of technology systems, your habits and your environment, right? So then we have understanding intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. In hindsight, the, the article is not that good. Honestly, if I, um, I would probably leave it. I mean, I, I am gonna leave it. This is my final assignment. I'm not gonna let them start. I'm not gonna um, change it now, but I would see how it plays with students in, in, a, in a live class and then probably have to go find something else because that was not that good of an article. But then we go to the blog prompts. So this is one of the places where I got to play with some of the ideas that I've been having or that I've been a proponent of, but working as an instructional designer, you have to go with the flow. You have to agree. Um, you have to agree to disagree. And sometimes you have to take what the instructor decides they want to go with. So one of the things I'm very um, big fan of is writing a lot <laughs> and choice. I think uh, choice is very important for the student because it will motivate them to do better. Uh, I like to tell the story uh, that when I was um, doing my economics minor, a uh, professor would give us in the, at the beginning of the semester, the choice to take three exams or you could trade one for an, at, like a research paper. I did the research paper every time because I much rather go and explore and find something that genuinely interests me, even if it's something like out there for, um, in, I think for an instructional, not for an instructional, for an industrial organization class, I wrote about like the underdog marketing from Apple <laughs> and how that got them in, you know, to into the like the creative market rather than becoming like a giant corporate, like corporate overlord, like like Microsoft used to be. And now they're now things have changed, right? But it was a fun, you know, thing to do because I just read a bunch of like, you know, industrial psychology papers and economic papers and looked at Apple's productivity or or Apple's production and then came away with a thesis, right? Uh, so I think choice is very important. I think writing is also very important because a lot of the things that you will figure out, you will figure out through writing on your own, right? So I think having them do like the annotations, discussions, the blog prompts, I think those are all would have, are great ways to do this. And personally, I mean, if you're not going, like I'm, I will say this, if I was, a, you know, as an instructor, if I was an actual instructor, which I hope to be in the, in the near future, I am, I even, I don't feel 100% confident being like a grammarian, you know, and, and telling like, hey, like your sentence fragment. Like, so what I would look for is 
organization style, you know, persuasiveness and uh, making good points in general, right? And then we can work through like you have a sentence fragment or your clear your your clarity is a little missing, and then send them to writing to the writing uh, center. But personally, I think the writing in a persuasive and communicative format is the most important part that they're, they're hopefully that they're learning from here. But choice, comes it comes down to choice, letting them have things, that, uh, letting them have options that they can pick from that they're hopefully more excited to talk about is one of the key things that I try to uh, bring into the class. So then we have module two, which is design thinking. So I introduce them um later on into like what is design like so you're solving problems and then i introduce them to addy which i'm familiar with since i'm an instructional designer uh we have analysis design development implementation and evaluation that's a perfectly good framework to approach like building habits so you wake up um well not you would you uh take a look at your habits like a uh 10 000, uh, feet view, like eagle's eye view of what you're doing throughout the week. You're checking how often you pick up your phone. Are you submitting things on time? Is your inbox like um, like thousands of emails overdue? You have like a bunch of reminders, nothing gets done. Okay, well, let's analyze that. Let's break it down into the smallest components and then design solutions to each of those problems. So I thought this was a great framework to apply, especially for freshmen. Like think about uh, everything as a problem to be solved rather than an insurmount insurmountable challenge. I, I guess I got some of that idea from reading some extrinsic, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation papers like last semester, but I thought this was really cool. So in this um, module, we are applying the analysis phase to some extent. We are summarizing the concept of habit formation and we evaluate our current habits. Uh, so then we have the chapters three and four for atomic habits. We have the block prompt, like what would you like to accomplish at the end of the semester? I think a very declarative statement is a great way or also part of the book is arguing for seeing habits as part of your identity. So um, switching the framework from um, I want to learn how to be ma do math to I want to be a mathematician, you know, I think is a great way to start, right? So giving them like a framework or I want to be uh, an active, I want to be a cyclist and then looking at the habits that a cyclist would have, obviously cycling is one of them, but maybe stretching, eating healthier, uh, finding a writing group, et cetera. So uh, yeah, I thought this were, were um, Hopefully students will pick up on that during the chapters three and four annotation. Uh, so there's a perusal again. Um, I was very thankful having a lot of classmates give me good feedback, especially one, uh, Chris, um, for one of his classes, he had to evaluate a course that was not his. He asked for permission to evaluate my course and he mentioned that feedback was missing. So I took the time to implement like a feedback guideline, like you will receive an average and like a scoring component. I will also go through and respond to you and tell you how well you're doing, et cetera, right? So then, you know, again, um, once the rubber hit the road, you, you realize, oh, I am missing PowerPoints. I'm missing videos. So I decided to do a PowerPoint and design thinking. I was very happy how that one came out. Um, then we did an analysis scorecard. So in one of the chapters of the book, one of the things that the, the person talks about is the point and calling system in Japan, where uh, train operators and security um, and, and um, train operators in Japan uh, have a system where they point and call the activity that they're about to do. So I'm about to uh, flip the, the, the switch and turn on the train and then report that. And everybody is aware of what's happening or somebody's like, I'm checking that there's nobody on the rail before the train arrives or I am driving at 55 miles per hour, according to the speedometer. So that is like a constant not letting things fall into um, into. <sighs> so not letting things fall into like uh, like. Uh, like automatic, like 
you know, behavior, like, a, like an automaton. So one of the things I had them do is like an analysis habit scorecard where they had to, uh, they had three tables and there's a little, there's a table attached. There's a Word document that they have to use. Uh, but they have to go through the day, one day, generally, like a student could be more ambitious and do and ambitious and do several more days, but they have to go through all the habits that they've done that day and then assign them a value. So waking up is a net neutral because everybody wakes up, but do you snooze your alarm or do you get up right away and then make coffee? I think that, I mean, I like coffee, so I, I put that as a positive. So then what happens next? And what's happened next? And then once you're done with the with the morning, what do you do in the afternoon? What do you do um, for dinner, for, for the evening? So bringing that awareness, that consciousness to uh, what you're doing, I thought would be a good activity. Then we have a, a quiz. Pers um, so the class required that we have at least one quiz. I met that guideline minimum. Personally, at the beginning of the semester, I was like, I'm not a big fan of having that guideline. I think it's unnecessary. But then I was reading a book from one of my colleagues at University of St. Thomas, and she uh, is talking a lot about simulations and scenarios. So I took advantage of the quiz to bring in more uh, simulations and scenarios. Of course, it's a quiz. You also want to have some multiple choice questions. You want to have uh, true and false questions because, you know, it's a quiz. You have like 10 questions or more. I'm not going to go through and design like at more essays for the students to do, but I took the chance to do some scenarios. Like you brought yourself, you've been brought to consult to for a startup company and they're having trouble with efficiency. So hopefully they apply some of the concept that they learn like analysis or chain or habit stacking and turn that into like a training for the for the for the uh, startup company right so thinking about that uh and also those scenarios allow the students to understand that everything that they're learning here has a real life application and no, nothing is being wasted you know uh next thing i had an optional again Love Peruso because it, it has the ability to uh, offer so many different multimodal functionalities. And one of the things that it allows is for me to link to podcasts. So I have a podcast, two podcast episodes on sleep. Personally, I think sleep, sleep is very important. I, my six month old just started sleeping nine hours straight. So you can imagine how important it was <laughs> a couple of months ago when I was getting absolutely zero sleep. So I also, a lot of uh, teenagers going into college are coming from their high school where they might be playing video games all night. I know I certainly was when I was uh, in high school. I would come home from, from school and play through like 10 or 11 at night and then go back to bed and wake up at six or seven in the morning. Um, plenty of times where I hit the snooze button so much that my dad had to walk in and be like, what are you doing? So. I think having like a good sleep habit is important. It's not just important, it's essential. It's healthy, it's, it's, it's good for your mental health, it's good for your physical health. Uh, it can reduce diabetes um, uh, risk, it can reduce mental illness risk, it can, it can reduce Alzheimer's and, and so on. So having a good sleep schedule, also good for your memory, you know, like, like remembering things, you know? So having a good sleep schedule is, definitely very important. So I hope that the students will be able to apply some of what they learn to their sleep schedule, right? So thinking about that sleep schedule and, and the habits that they've, they've been using and put that together. Then again, we have prompts one more time uh, for the blogs. So the students have to declare what kind of identity they wanna adopt going forward. Like I'm an avid cyclist, or I'm gonna I'm a reader, and I'm gonna read a hundred books in this next year. Uh, then I also give them some alternatives. Again, choice very important for me. So this one was like a real life example. Like your best friend tells you their children are having trouble concentrating after school. What can I have? Like how would you use what you've learned to explain some things to them? Um, that you're brought you're brought brought on to consult for a company having issues with work productivity. How do you conduct an analysis process? Um, 
uh, having them reflect about the plateau of latent potential, which is a, um, a topic that the instructor talks about, that the book talks about. Like there's often times where you're improving, but you haven't seen the results of that improvement until a little bit later. Like this happened to me with drawing. Like I used to draw quite a bit and I was like, oh, I'm not improving. And then later, little by little, you know, it just got, I got better and better and I, I miss drawing. <laughs> um, the other thing is like identifying like cue craving response and reward loops, basically like the Skinner boxes that are, are all around us, having them identify a positive and a negative example. So then they can become aware like, well, maybe notifications are not good for you, you know? And then that brings us to making time, which is our third module. Again, split into two weeks. So I don't know if you noticed so far, but I have a bit of a, a theme. So this person is overwhelmed. This person is starting to get their life together. All of a sudden, uh, I, I mean, corporate arts is the, one of the better examples I could find. It all of a sudden they're juggling a bunch of things and they're doing a lot of things at once. So hopefully I thought I could, it would be funny to tell like a little story at the top of uh, each module. Um, humor also, I try to be funny. Um, for example, in this, you know, I like old timey, like I do declare, you know, I thought it would be funny to include like not letting uh, it all be like boring formal writing. Like none of this feels like I didn't write it with a, with a very a formal writing approach. Like I did not. Uh, for example, here I say we start a new book, and I'm like all excited, you know. Uh, so hopefully that comes across. Also, like at the at the top in the course schedule, where I say some things overlap, you know, some activities overlap. Don't panic, you know. I try to get into the head of the student a little bit. I, I think, you know, I think one of the things that um one has to keep in mind is what you think you know about your students or your students actually show you is completely different and you, sometimes you have to learn to go with the flow on that uh but yeah so uh because this was an asynchronous course i try to convey a lot of my personality through writing you know if i had more time i definitely would have done more videos that would have been a more exciting or, or that would have been exciting but the thing is with video editing, rendering, et cetera, <laughs> I'm like not into it right now. So that's, that's what kept me from going with that. But again, so we have a new book. We're reading Make Time, which is about focusing on a specific task each day and then tracking what works and what doesn't work for you. So now you're building habits and your habits could be like you make coffee and then you meditate for, for a minute, right? And that's like, that's called chain stacking, uh, habit stacking. Like you do something positive, you, you do another you do another thing that's positive and another thing and another thing. And all of a sudden you have a stack of all the positive things that you're doing and then you're knocking several things in a row. But the habits have to be consistent. So one of the things that I hope that the students get from the time strategy, from the make time strategies is that um, they read and then they decide, okay, I'm gonna focus on this specific um task or this thing that's very important for to me like i'm not going to check my phone or i'm going to spend time with my kids i'm going to do two hours of drawing or i'm going to relax and not check my inbox and just watch three hours of netflix because i deserve it whatever it is that you're focusing on uh but you're developing some strategies like lasering um laser focus it's like you cut everything out like you you avoid distractions there's another one where um I would have to go through the rest of the book because it's been a long day. I'm tired, but there, there, there's so, so there's different strategies that you can try. And then one of the things that you come out of that is, are these beneficial? Like what's working, what, what's working, what's not working, and then hopefully they can focus on that in the in the journal in the journal area. So next we have like considering technology. So again, I want to bring a little bit of critique on whether technology makes you distracted or can be more beneficial uh, or benefit you as like a productivity tool. Uh, the book talks about infinity pools like Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, all those places are just built around constantly refreshing you with content, trying to pull you in longer and longer times. Same thing with YouTube, etc. So 
are all those te- are all the technologies that we have around us just that, or are there other technologies? Can they be can they be assistive, or are they all detrimental to your ability? And I would love to see that from the student's perspective. And then the question is, well, what can you do in your environment to reduce that? Right, like you know, the follow up question or or was something that they could tackle in like if they're using Notion is building a place that's focused and quiet and they can meditate or they can track their habits or it keeps it, it keeps them from going directly like constantly to Facebook or Twitter etc right then for week two we have the chapters two and three for the book uh, then we have time management now part of me thinks uh, I mean at least I have this perspective that if you're going to have this if the students are going to become more and more productive throughout the semester Technically, you should ramp up the difficulty. Like, like I did, I didn't, I could easily split, like make time into like several chapters, but I thought, you know, I mean, it's part one. Technically, this is just chapters one, and two, like intro and chapter one. But part one is like half the book. Like I thought it would be interesting to just leave them that option. And then they like, okay, they can track themselves if they need to. So then we also have, Uh, a blog that they have to answer, which is time management problem about a friend or relative asking you what you've learned or what advice you can give them. Uh, could probably be more specific uh, in hindsight, like it probably be more specific about the exact time management problem that the friend or relative or classmate is having. But, you know, see you on the semester. Um, project outline. So then they have to implement the design phase, which in our course is, just, is defined as brainstorming and sequencing. So you come up with a lot of ideas and then what ideas that work, you break them down into a sequence of things you have to do, right? Going back to the habit, uh, habit stacking, I thought that would be like a good way to make it all uh, wrap and be nice together. So they have to work on a project outline. I think this is a great uh you know, instructor student interaction because then I can see their thinking in the mind map and I can see their sequencing, making sure that they're kind of following the analysis uh, portion and implementing that, right? So you're finding a problem, you're developing a solution, right? And then you're, you're, you're developing a plan, right? Um, so yeah, so we have the project alliance. So this is, uh, I gave them the, again, asynchronous course. Um, not a call out to my classmates, but if it's an asynchronous course, it has to have more writing. <laughs> it has to have more writing than you think. You might think that a couple of instructions or the only times where you need to be more descriptive is in the assignments. No, I think you have to have your personality be conveyed through writing a lot. Uh, this wouldn't be all, this wouldn't be all the writing I have to look. I also have to do announcements. If this was a live class, I would have to respond to their to their discussion boards and their blogs. I would respond to them, ask them more questions, give them grades, give them feedback. So, so it's a lot more writing. It's a lot more work, which I mean, I already think faculty do a lot, man. I already think they, they work really hard. And this asynchronous aspect of online design is layered, it's, it's overlooked. And one of the things that I would love to see from the instruction design side is um, a focus on technical writing, a focus on creative writing, you know, like a combination of creative and technical writing. And also um, I think one of our, and I was selling this to a colleague, well, like one of our main uh, selling points has to be we're shifting the burden from the instructor SME to part of it to our shoulders. Like we know what needs, what's missing. We know what needs to be done. We can tell you, yes, you need to add more text, but what if, can I throw out some ideas? Can I make some suggestions? Can I write some of it myself? Like I worked with a professor in the spring semester to their communications class. And one of the things I was like, I need to add more, because we were partners, we were like, I thought we were on equal grounds. I took the advantage of the, the, the opportunity 
for that partnership to provide some more information in each module that we were developing, which I thought made the course stronger, you know? So one of the things that is overlooked in the asynchronous process when you're developing a course is that there's a lot of writing that needs to get done. So faculty and instructional designers need to think about creative writing and, you know, scenarios, storytelling, uh, simulations, um, bringing real life experience and tying it to what you're learning in the class, um, because you can't always wait for the students to put it, you know, put two and two together. It's wonderful when they, when they do, and it's lovely to see that from the students that are uh, on top of everything, but sometimes you need to do that yourself. So there's a lot of writing to be done, right? Uh, so I was very, like, I was very explicit. Like, so for example, my writing habit, if I wanna become a writer, like what am I, what should I be doing? Like, well, uh, write, you know, from 9.15 to 10.30, uh, book club, like read for 30 minutes, join a writing group, uh, revise and read some more on Saturdays and Sundays. So like how much, I mean, that's a real life scenario that like Ursula Le Guin and other authors wake up in the first thing in the morning, all they do is write for, for hours and end. And if you listen to writers talk and podcasts and interviews, um, you cannot be a good writer if you're not reading books. So giving yourself a timer. So I think, you know, bringing that in and not just letting them, giving them those examples, then give them some structure that they can reflect on and think like, well, what do I need to do if I want it to be this or that or, and so on. Okay, uh, we had to do rubrics. Uh, personally, um, I think this was a very easy activity for rubric again i'm just going with um i have to take an evaluation as an assessment course i will be honest with you uh for some of this i was vibing like i really was just vibing like this is my course i take ownership of it so i'm just gonna vibe and they're the students are gonna get a one through five so you got 15 uh you get a 15 points if you develop a mind mind correctly with three identities at least you have identified several habits for each. So you have to do some research, right? Um, and I could be more specific. Like I honestly could be a lot more specific, but one of the things is I don't want them to do the bare minimum. You know, I don't want them to do the bare minimum to get that five points. I want them to really try. And, you know, I could also convey that in the, in the instruction. So again, a lot more writing than you think. And then last is the student has developed an outline for their habits. Like boom, 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 five points uh, each. So great. Uh, so again, keeping with the story. Also, I was very proud to do this last spring, uh, having like diverse people in the images. Uh, of, like for this course, they're all women, but having like diverse individuals show up in your images, so everybody's included. Uh, cultural inclusivity and awareness and divert and diversity is like who's being represented. I think. Uh, not to get too into it, but the, the productivity feel is kind of white, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I listen to, I mean, it's ironic because I listened to one dude, Ali Abdal, who's like in like Indian, you know? Uh, he's in England, he's in London, but it's very, ang but it's like a very Anglo kind of feel or, or, or per, like mindset. So, like, I don't like, like, I'm trying to stay away from the, the, the grind mindset or the hustle culture. I just want them to think about how you can become a more, so, you know, center person by having good habits and getting rid of bad habits, right? So then we have, I thought this was really neat. We had to have one uh, synchronous meeting. I decided to wait until the last module to have a technology demo and Q&A. I thought everything else up to this point was very, was sufficient without like direct instructor facilitation because I wrote a lot of content. I thought the technology part, because I'm a technology, I came from a technology training background would be an exciting place to use my skills to talk about like enabling screen time tracking and restrictions uh, talk about iOS mobile device, uh, like uh, iOS and Android mobile features, um, advanced features and Notion. So that would have let me talk about my dashboard and show them all the stuff that I've done in my my dashboard. 
uh, have the students do Q and A and just demonstration, like just do demos for each of these things. So I thought that was like an interesting use of like the synchronous meeting. Also, um, some classmates had multiple synchronous meetings. They were they did not have as much description in their content. Uh, one of the things that I also did not see is outlines. So I thought when I was looking at other people's courses, I was like, I should have my own outline to um, if this if this is not mandatory, which none of my content is. I mean, you have to submit, you have to do homework, you have to do things to get a grade. But my synchronous meeting is not mandatory. How do I convey that the technology demo and Q and A are going to be important for your class? Well, I should have an outline laying out what is expected we'll be covering in this in this synchronous meeting. It also lets me have a structure, so I know if I, this is going to be a three hour demo, a three hour session, I have you know one, two, three, four, five, you know, well, technically three things. So I have like an hour to go over each, right? Because the Q and A and demonstration time is involved in all of them in all of those. So I thought the outline was a nice way to convey that. Uh, I think that's missing in all, like in a lot of courses, you know, not just the ones from my classmates, but in a lot of, in a lot of courses, faculty just throw a Zoom meeting that's frequent, that is supposed to happen every semester, every week or every other week, but there's no plan. I mean, they know faculty know what they're going to be talking about each week, right? But they don't convey that to their student except for the course schedule or course outline at the start of the syllabus. So having this as a reminder, I thought it would be like a good way of doing this. Um, I don't know if that's my hot take for the video, but there's my hot take. Um, so then I had, um, for this particular blog, very simple, at least I think I thought so is like finding new technology that you find interesting or useful and explain how it can be beneficial to others. Like the web, the, the internet is awash on productivity blogs and websites telling you to use this extension versus this app versus this software versus this thing, doing reviews, doing evaluations, um, blogging. Uh, so just go wild, go find something that's interesting and exciting for you and, and see and convey that and persuade your classmates to use it. Like I would have told them about uh, strict workflow, which, you know, blocks all the distracting websites for 25 minutes and gives you five minutes of break time. Um, you could use like the hypothesis extension. You could talk about uh, Sotero as a way to um, manage your citations. The, the sky's the limit, really. As an alternative, oh, I also wanted to say, as an alternative to the synchronous meeting, I gave them a discussion board that is not graded, but the students, if they cannot attend the synchronous meeting, they have to talk in the discussion board and ask questions. So again, that skill of Googling or Googling for, or asking questions in forums and finding answers from other people is very important, especially when you are playing with a lot of technology so having that developed from like an early stage from like freshman going into like senior year professional career the person that actually googles a problem in a technology department or in any department that google's problem and knows how to navigate forums and find like your driver is missing or try and enter this following terminal command on your mac that person is seen like as a fucking magician you know, so I've been speaking from experience. So I think this is like a good skill to have. It makes you more employable. It makes you like a, a better, per, you know, it makes you like an easier to work with. Um, you become essential uh, for your classmates and your friends and your coworkers. Um, it also saves you a lot of headaches, you know, like I Google, if I have a technical problem, no one's solving it around the house. So it's, I think like a good thing for the students to learn. It's a good habit, like Google it, find find a question, find an answer or ask the question and convey it in a way that everybody knows what you're talking about so they can answer it and help you find that information. Um, so yeah, and then last but not least is the project showcase. This would have been 
module four, this would have been the end of the course where the student has developed a template or a notion dashboard that includes several pages. So sub pages basically uh, that can include anything from a notebook and habit tracker. So the notebook could be like a journal. The habit tracker could be like their own version of um, like um, just taking the, the rows, like I've done this habit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times this week. Um, so yeah, that could be that. Now I found because Notion again is like a really well-known uh, productivity tool. They have basically has its own hashtag in Twitter and, and uh, TikTok. So I found a fantastic video that I embedded using HTML that basically shows them what okay, let me they show need you to do. My entire so, life need this. so this person basically lays out exactly what I want. Like I want a nice looking um, dashboard that has like separate into the dividers with productivity, with journaling, with et cetera, right? So I thought this was a really nice way to show and convey that. Like if I would have been it, if I wouldn't have found this, I probably would have made a video talking about my own dashboard. Okay, so that's technically the last week. If I had the chance to add more content, like if I had to make this like a full blown 16 week class, definitely would split those weeks into like their own modules. And then we're looking at future modules would include like a group project or like a partnership. So one of the things that the books talk about is um, partnering up with someone, having an accountability buddy. So we would have developed something for that, like develop like an accountability buddy, uh, join a group, uh, develop like a accountability sheet where you report how you're doing and your each of your habits and keep up with them. Hopefully uh, keep up with them up to and after you are done with this class and make a friend out of the whole process, like network, become like, you know, friends with someone like this person actually helped me uh, kick my cigarette habit or this person um, read my, my, uh, my, my, my fiction or my short fiction that I was, that I was working on when I was wanting to be a writer because he was in my, my group. And now we talk every day or we talk every other week. And I think that would have been, that would be nice, you know? So in the final week, I have like one last journal entry where I asked them like, how are you feeling about this course? What do you think this course did? Uh, what did you learn? Was this course helpful? And what could have been done better? So this is like their one place to give me some feedback. Obviously, I think there's an option or there should, there should be an, another option. It was not required in the, in the there, there was no requirement in this course to have like a feedback form, but definitely, uh, I would have added like a form where the students could report like bugs, uh, pages that are broken, um, problems with activities, etc. cetera, uh, questions. The last thing I included because it was re required, which I would have included anyways if it was part of like an institution. Uh, if I was part of an institution, it would be like Office of Accessibility, like mental health, and count, uh, mental health counseling and therapy the Moodle tech support, they're all fig numbers, so don't mind me. I like like put it, putting them to the library, technical support, writing center, et cetera, okay? So that concludes my tour, which I think was longer than I expected. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this. If you have questions, let me know. Um, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Bye.